fun and funny to be on, online. Um, so let's let's just dive in. So what I thought I would do is um, spend the first half hour um, essentially trying to give you a sense of some of the questions that um, animate a lot of the research going on in my group these days. And these are all questions relating to size. And, um, and so my main goal for the first part would be sort of to get across the questions and try to give you a sense of why I think these questions are exciting and interesting and why also they happen to be questions where I think uh, physicists can contribute a lot to act to real to really sort of um, important uh, big problems in, in cell biology. So it'll be uh, about size and uh, and let's maybe spend a little time just thinking about the history of this problem. If I, oops. Um, and it probably goes back um, much further, and I know it goes back further than Galileo, but um, probably one of the first um, sort of um, quantitative excursions into thinking about size of animals was in um, Galileo's dialogues. And there he actually posed this question of scaling, which is gonna be central to what I talk about. And um, what he was thinking about there is if you have a skeleton, uh, which will support the weight of an animal, and you think about the animal getting in linear dimensions greater. So if you increase the animal size, say by a factor of two, how should the bones geometry change so as to properly support the weight of the animal? So you know, if you increase the size, the linear size of an animal by a factor of two you expect its mass to go up by a factor of two cubed or eight. Therefore, the, uh, the weight that will have to be supported by its bones will go up by a factor of eight. Now, if at the same time you, you increased all the proportions of the animal by a factor of two, then the cross-section you know, area of the bones would increase by only by a factor of four. So therefore, eight divided by four is two. So what you would have is a doubling of the stress uh, that would be experiencing, that would that would, uh, the bones would experience, and therefore at some point this uh, scaling up by a factor of two would lead to fracture and failure of the bones. Right. So the idea is uh, that as you scale up animals, you would actually have to scale. You would have to change the geometry of the bone, make the uh, cross-sectional area much bigger, uh, so as to properly support the the weight. And that's of course why. A lot of the science fiction movies where you see these giant insects uh, that somehow emerge after a nuclear holocaust invading planet Earth and attacking humans is uh, not a great uh, story in the sense that those, those insects would certainly crumble under their own weight because often they're portrayed as just sort of scaled up versions of the insects that we know. Um, this idea of scaling and animal size is probably, if you're interested, there. Uh, one of the nicest essays of one, uh, that I read about this is by Haldane. Uh, you can find it online. It's on being the right size. And he has this uh, wonderful uh, sort of um, statement in, the, in, the, in his essay where he says, the most obvious differences between different animals are differences of size. And it's easy to show that a hare could not be as large as a hippopotamus. Again, he's alluding here to uh, some, the thing that Galileo had already noticed, or a whale as small as a herring. And I love this concluding sentence of this quote, every, for every type of animal, there's a most convenient size. And uh, uh, so you can see clearly, if you look at these two skeletons I just picked off the web a few minutes ago, actually, uh, on the left is the hare and the right is the hippopotamus. And I don't even have to put scale bars on these skeletons and you can kind of tell by the difference in the geometry of the bones that uh, which one is the much bigger animal, the hippopotamus being on the right. So, um, um, so anyway, so, so this question, so what I, the reason I brought up uh, Galileo and Haldane is that this question of size is something that's really uh, been a question that people have considered for, 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 for eons. And uh, usually it's been the context of animals. But uh, as uh, we started, as we sort of uh, start making microscopes and starting, and we start looking at what's inside cells, the same kind of questions can be asked both of cells themselves, but also uh, about 
the internal structures inside cells. And this is, this is what I, I, I want to kind of spend this hour uh, discussing. So uh, the first thing to, uh, to note is that uh, the range of cell sizes, and here I, I'm showing human cell sizes, uh, uh, that's a <laughs> a slide I stole for, from Jan Scottheim uh, is 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 quite large. At least you know almost six orders of magnitude uh, going from uh, sperm cells to oocytes. And what's important to remember is this very large uh, uh, dynamic range of cell sizes. This is uh, volume, so uh, six orders of magnitude in volume implies two orders of magnitude in uh, in linear dimension. Um, and what, what's important to kind of remember about cells, something that I wasn't taught when I took biology in, in high school. In fact, uh, my biology class in high school was so bad that I decided I would never take up the subject again and, and stayed away from it uh, uh, for a good uh, 30 years. But uh, what no one ever told me, and I think I would have been very excited if someone had shown me this picture, is that actually the cell interior itself is not a sort of a, a bag of chemicals, not a sort of a uniform distribution of molecules with chemistry going on. It's this very well organized, as you all know, uh, structure with um, the nucleus, you know, which contains all the DNA where all the information processing happens. Right on, on the outskirts of the nucleus is this green structure, the endoplasmatic reticulum where proteins are made and shipped off to the Golgi. Which are then, you know, often stored in, in in vesicles, which are taken up by molecular motors and, and shipped along these microtubules that you see as blue. So there's this beautiful organization, and part of this organization is also that there are internal structures like the Golgi, like the ER, like the nucleus, and the fact that uh, cells ra range in size by 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 all this uh, by this amount that I just showed in the previous slide naturally raises the question of what happens to these internal structures? Are they proper, are, do they always have the same size regardless of the cell size or do they actually scale with the size of the cell? And that, that's uh, a question again, that's, that's been around for, for quite a long time and um, almost, you know, almost 200 years at this point. And probably the first to my knowledge uh, sort of um, paper that, that looked at some of these issues of the size of, of organelles was this uh, paper by none other than uh, Dr. Gulliver. So, uh, so that's kind of fun. Um, and Gulliver in 1875 wrote this paper where he looked at the size of nuclei in red blood cells. So some of you might have learned somewhere that red blood cells don't have nuclei. That's true, as you can see in the top of this figure for a number of different uh, species, but not for everyone. Uh, so certainly true of human red blood cells, but not true of uh, all these other organisms. And what Gulliver notices is that smaller red, red blood cells have smaller nuclei, larger uh, red blood cells have larger nuclei. Um, Conkling and Conklin, sorry, in 1912, did this really wonderful experiment whereby centrifugation, he was able to change the size of the cytoplasm uh, within which, uh, within which uh, mitotic spindle that you can see here doing its business of separating chromosome in the top right corner, uh, the, um, the mitotic spindle forms in, this, in the cytoplasm um, of these, um, of these uh, embryonic cells of this worm. And what he noticed is that by centrifuging, you can make the cytoplasm of one uh, cell larger than the other. And the spindle that formed in the larger cell was larger. So again, there's kind of this idea that this structure, namely the spindle, uh, self-assembles inside, inside the cell in a way that's uh, consistent, that's uh, proportional to the size of the, of the cell itself. Um, more sort of more, you know, you know, turning back the, you know, pushing back the clock literally 100 years. So that was 1912, 2013. Uh, there's this beautiful experiment by, by Matt Good, who was a postdoc at, at, at Berkeley at the, at the time. And what they did there is um, they actually took uh, cytoplasmic extract and mixed it with oil to make these uh, oil droplets filled with cytoplasm. So, um, and they could, by using sort of clever, clever sorry, microfluidic uh, tricks, they could tune the size of these droplets. And what they observed is that as they made the droplets bigger, they could also seed the droplets with a bit of DNA, 
uh, which is here uh, uh, labeled in green, and they would see the formation of spindles around the DNA, and the big droplets would have the spindles that would form would be larger, and the small droplets would have smaller spindles. And in fact, um, quantitative, you know, doing sort of uh, careful quantitative experiments on this revealed that if you plot the droplet diameter versus the spindle length, there's a roughly linear scaling of the two. And uh, so then that, you know, now uh, begs the question. What is you know how is it that uh, the assembly process uh, goes on and um, and produces uh, produces such uh, such uh, scaling and structures that are properly sized to the to the uh, size of the cell? The reason that's uh, you know so the you know so should this be surprising or not? Of course, always the question of surprise always depends on it always depends on sort of what uh, where you come from what your prejudices about the problem are so one way to think about assembly is to think about the fact that like in this case uh, what you're doing is uh, watching sort of chemistry unfold and accompanied by of course diffusion of, of the molecules in this uh, in this um, lipid droplet and of course um, Reaction diffusion systems, as sort of described by Turing, will naturally lead to a length scale, and maybe that length scale in this case could be the length of the spindle. But what's you know, what we know is that those length scales are dictated by a combination of a diffusion constant and a reaction um, and a reaction rate. So if you want to get a length scale, diffusion constants have units of microns squared per second, and a length is uh, sorry, a uh, rate is a uh, one per second unit. So in order to get a length, you need to take the diffusion constant and divide it by the rate, right? And take a square root, and that will give you a length. But now you see that length, it's hard to imagine how that length could depend on the size of the vesicle in which uh, the length uh, emerges, right? Because you don't expect the diffusion of the molecules to depend on the size. Um, on the end, the reaction rate as well seems kind of a funny thing to depend on size, but maybe that's something that could depend on size. It's so that that might be sort of a an avenue along which you can try to explore explore where the scaling comes from. So anyway, so just to throw out some some ideas one might start thinking about in the context the context of these experiments. Um, so where I wanted to show you this uh, beautiful video from National Geographic, I, I encourage you to look at the whole video. Because uh, this, uh, this question of how internal structures, organelles scale with the size of the cell really becomes uh, a very acute question in the context of development when you have an embryo like the one you see here dividing where the size of the embryo stays fixed. But as the embryo divides, the size of the individual cells, as you can see, gets smaller and smaller. So for these cells to properly function, the nuclei within these cells, the spindles, the ER, Golgi, they all need to sort of scale appropriately with the size of the cell. So this, um, whatever the self-assembly process is that is occurring inside the cells should be, uh, you know, if we're doing the engineering right, should be such that um, the cells as they get smaller and smaller indeed have organelles that are scaled appropriately and proportionally to the size of the cell. And indeed, um, and indeed, oops, uh, uh, there's, uh, and I'm going to spend, and this was all by way of introduction, really, to, to get us all thinking about this uh, experiment, which, which I'm a huge fan of. Uh, it was uh, done uh, by Steph Weber uh, when, she was a, when she was a postdoc at Princeton. And what Steph looked at here um, was the scaling uh, of uh, the nucleoli. So as shown here, for those of you who uh, might not remember your um, cell biology, um, nucleoli are organelles uh, that are internal to the nucleus. And they're um, basically the site of uh, ribogenesis, the creation of ribosomes. So they're they consist of ribosomal DNA, which contains the genes that encode the parts of the ribosome. And uh, also it contains a number of enzymes that do various kinds of processes, uh, uh, process, do various kinds of processing of the ribosomal DNA. Uh, so they're 
uh, structures that form with their structures that form within the nucleus of the cell. And what you can see in the bottom uh, left picture here is an image of again uh, the C. elegans embryo, which <clears throat> um, we saw we saw um, earlier as well. And uh, what Steph has done here, and you can see sort of the, the scale bar. I can't because I don't know how to get. Ah, there we go. Um, so you can see the scale bar of 10 micrometers. And what uh, cell has uh, what Steph has done here, you see, is labeled the cell membrane. So that's in red. And then she has GFP uh, placed on one of the proteins. Uh, it's a methyl transferase, I believe, called Fib1. Doesn't matter uh, for our purposes, but it's one of the protein constituents of the nucleolus. So uh, for example, what you see here in the, in the top is two bright green spots, what that means, and a haze of green. So the haze of green is the nucleus. So there are these Fib1 proteins scattered throughout the nucleus, but then they concentrate at the nucleolus. And there, for example, you can see two nucleoli, presumably because there are two copies of the ribosomal DNA, which serves as uh, the nucleating site of the nucleolus. So you, have, you see these two bright spots. In some of the other nuclei, you see one or no bright spots, meaning the nucleolus. Either you have one or uh, none, or maybe the, there are two, but you can't see it given how the image was taken. Um, so um, so uh, not surprisingly, I mean, not surprisingly, given what I've told you thus far, as uh, development continues, uh, the two cells become four cells, become eight cells, become 16 cells. And as this goes on, the size of the nucleus gets smaller and smaller and smaller. The cells get smaller and smaller and smaller. The size of the nucleus gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And the size of the nucleolus itself gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And you can see that this in this video, if you just look at these bright spots, you see that they're getting, the spots themselves are getting smaller. And there's also the halo around them, which are the nuclei, and uh, they're getting uh, smaller as well. So the question is, what is the nature of the assembly? What are the dynamics of the assembly of the nucleolus that leads to this, this kind of scaling? So that's going to be sort of this, uh, the first, uh, uh, the thing we're going to tackle. And, um, and uh, sort of the, the basic idea uh, that um, I will try to show you is actually a very good idea in the sense that it can account for uh, some, some, can account quantitatively for the data and even make a prediction that, uh, that uh, can be tested and was tested experimentally. So I'll try to walk you through that, is uh, that what is going on here is a very simple process uh, by which cells can control the size of uh, their internal structures. It goes by the name of the limiting pool. Um, and uh, the idea couldn't be more simpler and that is, if you're a cell and you want to make a structure that is uh, here, I'm showing you the version of that uh, model with Lego blocks, um, which I like a lot. So if you want to build, if you want within uh, the cell to, assemb to assemble a linear structure, like for example here, it's this tower of Lego blocks and you want the tower to be five Legos big, all you have to do is make five Legos and let them all come together and uh, make sure the interactions are such that they stack on top of each other and you'll get a tower of five Legos. If you express six Legos, you'll get a tower of six Legos. So that's, that's uh, sort of, and, and we'll, we'll get into this a little more, but that's the crux of the idea. So, uh, so that's called the limiting pool mechanism and it's, and it's uh, sort of something that's been proposed, not just uh, for nucleoli, even though I think the evidence for nucleoli is probably the best, but also for things like centrosomes and even nuclei, even though I would say uh, some recent beautiful work by, uh, that came out of uh, experiments out of Fred Chang's lab and uh, with a number of collaborators, including uh, Thomas Fai, who's a colleague of mine has, for example, for nuclei, uh, I try to argue, and I think very successfully argue, that the size is, size is actually set by mechanical forces. Um, but um, anyway, so um, there's, like I said, uh, some evidence or good amount of evidence that uh, that this uh, mechanism for controlling size is is actually fairly well, uh, it is fairly utilized uh, across a number of different uh, systems and cells. So, um, <clears throat> so what I wanted to do. 
Yeah. Rani, you have five minutes for the tutorial section, please. Oh, okay. Well, this is the tutorial section, but what I wanted to do is now uh, just uh, switch gears a little bit and the five minutes uh, actually guide you through um, guide you through sort of uh, uh, a calculation uh, that uh, in which just to show you how actually this idea of a limiting pool can actually be used to to address uh, to address uh, this uh, uh, this question of the size of the nucleolus and if I can get my uh, iPad up and running um, we can do that I hope um, so let's see um, so I wanted to just show you some some notes um, and maybe I can get rid of myself here. Ah, very good. I think I've gotten rid of myself. Good. So, uh, so here's uh, sort of uh, my attempt to try to kind of show how this uh, finite uh, limiting pool mechanism can kind of really well describe this data. So the idea is the, the idea is very simple. So here's here's the data, right? So you go from eight cells to sixteen to thirty two to sixty four, and if you zoom in on one of the nuclei. The nuclei are getting bigger, and then the nucleoli within the nuclei are also getting, uh, at, sorry, the nuclei are getting smaller, and the nucleoli are getting smaller and smaller. So the idea is, uh, is going to be very simple. We're going to think about the assembly of a nucleolus. Uh, M is the size of the nucleolus, which is going to be, in this case, measured by the amount of fluorescence. So it's uh, something that's proportional to the number of these Fib1 molecules. And uh, the rate of change of the size of the nucleolus is just going to be birth minus death. I mean, birth being how many molecules of Fib1 are entering the nucleolus per unit time, death here meaning how many Fib1 molecules are leaving the nucleolus per unit time. And if we just make a simple sort of uh, assumption or just use what we learned from chemistry, namely that the rate at which molecules arrive at the nucleolus is some second order rate constant times the free concentration, and that's really important, of the nucleolar particles. Then we can write down, and we write down the free concentration as, this is uh, the following, the total number of particles, n, minus the number of particles that are in the nucleoli. So since each nucleolus has a mass m, the total number of particles in the two nucleoli is 2m. And we divide that by the volume of the nucleus. So that would be the concentration of free uh, nuclear particles, let's call them. And then we just make a simple assumption that the rate at which the particles leave is uh, some constant k minus. Then uh, we can figure out what's the size of the nucleolus in steady state. And steady state just means that the rate of change, the MDT is zero. In other words, birth equals death. So uh, if we set the rate of birth equal to the rate of death, then what comes out is that the concentration of free uh, nuclear particles is the ratio of the dissociation constant to the second order association constant, something that biochemists do a lot. And that ratio is called the dis disassociation constant. It's uh, the simple, uh, simplest thing you can imagine is that this is something that just measures the free energy difference for the nucleolar particle to be in the cytoplasm versus for it to be in the nucleolus. Um, so we call that KD. So now if we substitute that in and we write out the concentration of the free uh, nucleolar particles as we did before in terms of the mass of the nucleolus, M, so the concentration of free particles is N minus 2M, which is the number of free particles divided by the volume of the nucleolus and set that equal to KD in steady state. This gives us a very simple relationship between the size of the nucleolus, the total number of nucleolar particles, and the volume of the, of the nucleus, right? So this is a very simple relationship. And then we can ask, to what extent is this relationship something that Steph sees in experiments? And if you allow me a minute, we can do that very quickly. First of all, uh, there's two kinds of experiments that, that Steph does. In one experiment, she keeps uh, the number of nucleolar particles in the nucleus fixed. And the way she does that is she treats the nuclei or the cells with, uh, she introduces RNA interference. And what that does, it's, it's through processes largely we don't understand. She finds ways of essentially making the nuclei bigger or smaller 
And these, this is all happening in a particular, uh, I think it was the eight cell stage. So the, what's going on is you're, you can think of it as treating, it's not drugs, it's, it's RNA interference, but you can think of it as treating the nuclei with drugs and that swells the nucleus or makes it smaller while the contents of the nucleus do not change. So that's equivalent to changing the size of the compartment while keeping the total number of particles in the compartment fixed. And if you do that, then if you keep the number of particles fixed, the prediction is that the size of the nucleolus will decrease linearly with the volume of the nucleus. And indeed, here's the data. These are the data points. You see the data is very noisy. Uh, these are the means with the errors of the mean, or I forget, or the standard deviations, I'm not sure. But they do seem to line up nicely on this line. And uh, the slope of the line would then, based on our theory, right, the slope of the line would be KD, which is this uh, dissociation constant. And the intercept of the line would be the number of uh, nuclear particles. So uh, this graph in the paper was a little awkward because it didn't start on the x-axis at zero. So I just, last night, I just moved it here so that zero so I can get the proper intercept. The intercept is 10 to the sixth. Particles, the particles here are measured in fluorescence units, so some weird arbitrary units. So there's, that's n is 10 to the 6, so this is n. And the slope uh, is, uh, well, how did I get that? 10 to the 6 divided by 320 uh, microns cubed, so about 3,000 arbitrary units per microns cubed. Okay. Now, uh, once I have the number of particles, I can figure out the concentration uh, of these nuclear particles. Namely, that's n, which is 10 to the 6, divided by the volume, and this is the volume of the nucleus at the eighth cell stage when you don't treat it. So that's the control, if you will. So that's the control at 250. And you get 4,000 arbitrary units per micron cubed. Now, why this is interesting? Well, if you follow the nucleus from one uh, stage of development to the next, what's happening is the cells are getting smaller, but the overall, and she's checked this, the overall concentration of nucleoli particles in the embryo is fixed. And that concentration we just figured out is 4,000 arbitrary units per micron cube. So that in the process of development should stay fixed because development is basically in this, in the context of these Fib1 particles is just uh, making smaller and smaller compartments that can let, contain less and less of these Fib1 particles, while the overall number in the whole embryo is fixed. And therefore, as the embryo's volume is fixed, the concentration is fixed. So the process of development happens at fixed concentration. But if we have a fixed concentration, then our equation for the size of the nucleolus, which is shown here, is still correct. But then n, the number of particles in the uh, nucleo nucleus, that should just be the concentration times the volume of the nucleus, because now the volume of the nucleus is changing from stage to stage to stage, right? So if we include that, then if we include that during development, the number of nuclear particles is the fixed concentration times the volume of the nucleus, well, now you get something very different, and the mass of the nucleolus is going to grow proportional to, proportionally to the volume of the nucleus. And most importantly, it's going to be a straight line through zero, zero. So that's one prediction. So here's the data. So these are different stages of now. These are the volume of the nucleus is changing, but it's changing because you're going from eight cells to 16 to 32 to 64. And you can see this line here. Again, data is as good as it is. Uh, it roughly grows through zero. But here's the best part. The, <laughs> the slope, now we, we, don't, we have a prediction for it. And the slope should just be the concentration minus KD. And the concentration is four. We figured this out from this data, which was just doing RNAi at stage eight, right? So we figured out that C is 4,000 and KD is 3,000. So the difference nicely is 1,000. And that's the slope. And this blue line here, that's not a fit. That's a prediction. So the prediction is from the previous data set is that these data should lie on a line that goes through zero to zero and has a slope of a thousand arbitrary units per micron cube, which seems to work. So it's, so it's a really nice example where actually the experiments were done in such a way that you could have this kind of non-trivial test of, of the idea. And uh, just because those 
words are used as well. If you read Steph's paper, you see that they actually uh, use a complementary uh, or sorry, equivalent idea, or sorry, mathematically equivalent to this is the idea of liquid liquid phase separation, which of course Tony and company really like to talk about. I prefer to talk about rates uh, and critical concentration, something that's even older than, than liquid liquid phase separation, but it's actually the same idea. So, um, um, so anyway, so um, I'm going to stop here because I'm out of time. Um, and, uh, and what I hope to have done here is just kind of whet your appetite for, for questions of size. Great, thank you. <laughs> that was great. We are running a little over time. So maybe you could, we could just keep the questions for after. And you could That's just... okay because I wanted to spend actually more time on this than my than my research, which I which is fine. But I, so I I will do my research talk in fifteen minutes because uh, okay then maybe uh, maybe I, I'm more I'm more interested in trying to get people excited mm -hmm. about the questions of questions of size in cell biology and sort of so uh, maybe maybe we can take one question. Uh, Greg Huber yeah. wanted to know. Since the nucleus is just a special, since the nuclear envelope is just a specialized compartment of the ER, does the ER get smaller, stay the same, or increase as the nucleus decreases in size? I can I don't know. <laughs> good, good question. Good yeah, question. great question. Uh, I think there's not in this system, but I have to remember. Yeah, I just can't remember now if there's data out there on the ER. There's really nice data on, on mitochondria and yeast and how that scales with the size of yeast uh, that Wallace Marshall wrote a, a paper there. You'll find Wallace Marshall science uh, maybe a decade ago. I, I, I said ER, I know, but now that I'm thinking about it, I'm not sure that there's, I can't remember if there's actually, I feel like there's some, uh, some, um, paper out there on ER, but I just, just, it's eluding me. Well, right if, now. Right. well, maybe, maybe if Wallace stays on till the end of the talk, we can have him chime in in the informal discussion later. Why don't you get started with the second half? Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. So, so, um, yeah. So, um, the idea that I hope you think you, you agree with me that, uh, that size is cool. Um, so, um, so where, you know, what is it that, that, um, so this, this, um, uh, this, this, uh, problem of, of Steph's is something actually we've, we've been, uh, playing around with, um, but, um, that's, hasn't really been the main thrust of our, our research and the main thrust of our research, uh, for the past, uh, almost decade now has been, uh, the question of length. And um, and now, you know, the, the point I want to make first is there's a number of sort of when we talk about length or when I talk about length, I guess I, I, I'm mostly thinking about various cytoskeletal structures. And in particular, I'm excited about the ones that are that whose geometry is that of a filament, because then when we think about size, it's a very simple question. And that is, that what is it? What is what is it that sets the length? Of the structure. So, what is it that sets the length of a flagellum? Uh, this is uh, a picture of a of a, uh, what's it called uh, giardia, nasty critter. Uh, something we've worked on quite a bit with, on. Uh, stereocilia. These are uh, structures that are in the hair cells of every one of our ears. Uh, they're responsible for, for detecting uh, sound waves and hearing. You get this beautiful staircase structure. These, these, all these are actin-based structures that come out of a single cell. And it's like this geometry is just fascinating. And how does it uh, come about is a great question that, that's been bugging me for at least a decade. And uh, mostly confusion reigns. I have no idea. And then some, some a place where we have made some progress is thinking about actin cables. So these are these linear structures that form in budding yeast uh, that you can see here uh, in this uh, in this image. And um, yeah, and so I want to spend a little bit of time talking about how um, filaments of a specific length are assembled. And and uh, and Ashok, please tell me when it's five minutes up, and let's let's make sure we stop at an hour. So I I, I won't take the you know just. Keep me honest here, please. Um, so, um, so let me just tell you a little bit about cables. So they form in budding yeast when the bud forms. Uh, and this is not a great movie here. You might see 
little uh, white dots kind of moving around. These are uh, secretory vesicles, and that's what cables are used for. They're actually used for transporting the secretory vesicles to the bud. So it brings uh, the protein goodies that the, that the bud needs in order to grow and become a new cell. And a lot is known about the structure of these cables, uh, how they form, what the, what the protein components are, as, as, is, as is often the case in cell biology. We know a lot about all the different components, what they do. A lot of the components have been studied in detail in vitro out of the cell. And the question remains, when you put all these things together, how do they make uh, filaments of, this, of a specific length? And the thing that got me excited about this question was that, uh, well, yeast occur uh, at different sizes in nature for you know the difference between a haploid and a diploid is quite large but even if you look at just haploid yeast there's a vari variation in their size it's not huge but there's some and you can then ask the question well what happens to these cables do they actually scale to the size of the cell or are they just always a particular length and uh, what we found is that they actually um, span the mother cell so in wild type cells regardless of their size the cables grow to reach the, the end, as shown in this little cartoon video on the right. They grow to reach the end of the, of the mother cell. Uh, as you'll, I'll show you data soon. They, they grow in tens of seconds. Uh, if, you, uh, inhibit, um, if you inhibit growth and just re leave this assembly, you see here how they disappear. Uh, they're gone in tens of seconds. So these are very transient structures. They come and go very quickly. Uh, or I should say the molecules that make up these structures come and go very quickly, but the structures themselves persist for tens of minutes. So it's a very dynamic structure in the sense that the molecular components are constantly turning over, yet the structure itself maintains this roughly this length, which is, the, which is of the size of, which is of the length of the cell. And, um, and now uh, here's actually some data taken by a postdoc in our group, Shane. McInally. And so what he did here is he looked at yeast cells of different size. Uh, he generated different sizes, either by looking at haploid versus diploid, but then also doing some, some making some mutants, uh, which disrupt the cell cycle and can lead to very large yeast cells. So these induced guys grow quite large. So for example, uh, in the first graph, you can see how large. Um, these are measurements of the length of the mother cell. So that's the distance from the bud neck to the south pole, which is on the other side. And you can see the smallest cells that we have are these haploids. And the largest, the yellow ones, are these uh, mutants where the cell cycle has been disrupted. And when we look at cable lengths in these cells, we, we see immediately that on average, the, largest, the larger cells have larger, larger cables. And in fact, uh, if we look at the distribution of lengths, uh, we find something which got us really excited, which is uh, when we look when we normalize the cable lengths by the length of the mother cell, then all these distributions fall on top of each other. In other words, not only does the mean of the length uh, of the cable length scale with the size of the cell, but the whole distribution seems to scale with the size of the cell. So the whole distribution of lengths of these cables seems to be determined by the geometry of the cell, and in particular by the length of the cell. Uh, we don't have good enough data, but we seem to we have data that also suggests that it's that it's literally the linear dimension. So if you make very long cells, the cables become long. So it's not the volume, but the linear dimension of the cell. And um, and from the point of view of this limiting pool model that I just described for you, this is a big, this is really weird, right? Because, well, we can discuss there are more than, there's more than one cable. So what I'm gonna show you here now is a bit of a white lie, but, uh, but, not, but, but I just wanna make it to make the point. And the, just the point I wanna make is that a limiting pool is not a particularly good, <laughs> is not at all a good mechanism for controlling length, right? And that goes back to Galileo and company the problem is that if you uh, maintain a constant concentration, which, which we have data for, so as yeast cells get bigger, almost all the proteins that have been looked at, and this is some beautiful work from Jan Scottheim's lab, have a constant concentration. So if you have a constant concentration, if you make the cell double in linear dimensions, that means the number of building blocks will go up by a factor of eight as the volume. So if those building blocks self-assemble into a linear structure, the, le the length of that will go up by a factor of eight, not by a factor of two, which is what we in fact see. So a simple limiting pool uh, without other bells and whistles will not do. 
unlike in the nucleolus, which is a three-dimensional structure, and the nucleolus uh, volume scales with the volume of the of the nucleus of the compartments. In that case, the limiting pool is perfectly competent at controlling uh, size. Length, not so much. So other ideas are, are needed. That's, that's kind of my main point here. And so uh, in the little remaining time I have, uh, why don't I skip this? Everyone knows that uh, actin filaments are assembled and disassembled, I, assemble, I assume in this, in this talk. But in the, limiting, in the remaining time I, I, uh, I'm gonna, uh, I have is just gonna give you some ideas, some of the th ideas we've tried out. Uh, some have been more, some less successful in trying to understand what is it if it's not the limiting pool that restricts or controls, I should say, the length of these, of these cables. And we've taken an approach basically from dynamical systems theory and said, well, okay, if I want to have uh, sort of a growth process of growing these cables, and I see there, uh, I'll show you videos, they grow, they, 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 they disassemble. In fact, uh, let's look at a video. So just so you have a picture in your head. So here's some beautiful videos taken by Shane where you can see a cable growing and then this, and you know, he actually stops the video when it's grown to its full length. But it starts as a small structure and it grows. And you can see the seconds blowing by at the top left to give you a sense of how dynamic this thing is. So, uh, so there's uh, growth going on here. So we should describe the change of length as a dynamical system. And, uh, and so the simple thing to say is that is to write out uh, an ODE, right? To write a differential equation say, oh, the rate of change of length, there's some assembly, which may be length dependent, and there's some disassembly, which might be length dependent. And if we make the assembly, and if it turns out by some molecular miracle, or I mean, not miracle, but some molecular uh, mechanism that assembly and disassembly change with length in a way that's shown in this figure at the bottom right, then what you will have is uh, length uh, of where the uh, dynamics uh, reaches a steady state because uh, when these when the assembly equals disassembly, there will be no net growth. And of course, I've set this up in such a way that if the length fluctuates a little bit away from the steady state, there will be uh, net disassembly. And if it fluctuates a little bit to the left of the steady state, namely to lower lengths, there will be net assembly. And so this will be a stable fixed point in the drawing that I've shown here. So the question we asked is to what extent is, uh, is the length a stable fixed point of some dynamics, which we actually don't have a firm grasp of in terms of the molecular microscopic detail. So we try to test that idea. And the way we went about testing it is, uh, well, first of all, we asked like, okay, if that's the case, uh, for reasons that I can get into, we favored the idea that the assembly rate is constant while the disassembly rate is length dependent. But if that's the case, we have, the first thing we asked, well, how do we get scaling? Well, you, you know, one simple way would be if the disassembly rate as a function of the length of the cable and the radius of the cell, the radius of the cell is this dimension, is actually a function not of the length and the radius independently, but is a function of the ratio. So if that's true, so that's the further assumption I'm making, then of course in steady state, when the LDT is zero, uh, the steady state length will scale with R. That's obvious and you'll get, we get the kind of scaling that we observe. So the question is to what extent, you know, is this true? And what uh, we set out to do is actually measure how the cable length changes with time. And uh, through these kinds of videos, Shane was able to do that. And from that, he's able to extract, obviously, much more, it's a much more noisy data set once you start basically, obviously, looking at derivatives of this. But you're able to look at how the extension rate changes with time. And also, we can plot the extension rate versus the length. And the first thing you see is that as the extension rate over time decreases. So that's telling you what we observe here. And you can see that because this, uh, this length versus time is not, it sort of goes to a steady, you know, goes, uh, the slope decreases. That's the slope shown here. So what's telling you is that the extension of this cable decelerates with time. So that's consistent with this idea that it's, uh, that there's some kind of a feedback control system uh, in place. That's, uh, and then um, the other sort of thing then, uh, uh, a direct prediction of the of this is that well, if there is such a feedback system in place, then what we should see is that in larger cells the deceleration should be slower. And in fact, that's what we see. So when we look at the induced cells shown here in yellow, which are bigger than the induced cells, 
we see that the extension rate as the cable gets longer decays, but it decays much more slow. And um, oops. it decays more slowly. And also the prediction would be is if we now replotted this and plotted it as cable length, where the cable lengths are normalized by the mother cell length, then this extension rates should uh, actually collapse onto each other. And to the extent that they do, uh, you know, the data is quite noisy at this point still, uh, and I don't think we'll be able to get better than, than that. Um, we sort of see evidence here, I think, uh, of, of the existence of some kind of a dynamical systems feedback where the feedback is scale invariant. In other words, it's properly scaled to the size of the cell. Of course, um, what that uh, leaves open is the question is, what is the molecular nature of this feedback, right? So, what we're claiming here is that the dynamics of these filaments, when we look at them in the smaller and the bigger cells, and that's kind of illustrated by the graph below, is such that there's dynamical feedback, which means that DL, DT is some function of L, and R, R being the size of the cell, and that this feedback is scale invariant. And uh, we've tried to detect, you know, so one thing we've done is look at a number of different knockouts, looking at different genes, because we know all the proteins that, uh, that control uh, that, that are, sorry, involved in making the cables and, and sort of uh, affecting uh, the proteins that affect polymerization, depolymerization. We can talk about all these things if anyone's interested. And what we find is something quite fun and I find very exciting. And that is when we do like single knockouts, we actually see very little effects on, on this, on this uh, feedback. It just seems to kind of stay there um, and seems to be quite robust. And so this is something that, that we are trying to, trying to understand. And, uh, and I could stop here, Ashok, or I can give you a final sort of, uh, uh, so where we are right now, because we do actually think we know what the, where the feedback comes from. And I can say a little bit about that, or I can just stop. Because you, really do, you, do have, you do have more time, so why don't you go ahead? Okay, so just, I don't know if anyone's interested at this point. You know, what I tell my students always is, you got to convince people that whatever the question is you're asking is interesting. So if I've done my job right, and I can't tell if I have, I'm guessing I have not, but uh, because I feel like I've been talking too fast. But uh, if I've done job, my job right, I've told you what the interesting questions are. And, and just to recap again, cables are these linear structures. And this is not just in the case of cables. We also see evidence of this for flagella in Chlamydomonas with some experiments with Wallace Marshall. We see it in flagella and Giardia, some experiments with Shane and his former advisor, Scott Dawson. Um, so there are linear structures and they scale with the length of the cell. And that's a weird thing if you think about limiting pool. So that's point number one, because linear things scale differently than volumes. And then the other thing I wanted to point out is that when we look at cells of different size, uh, well, what I wanted to point out is that there's some kind of, seems to be some kind of a feedback system that's built up of all the molecular components that provides this uh, scaling, okay? And so then the, now, uh, you know, so that, that's the kind of important stuff. So, um, so this kind of summarizes the main observations. There's a distribution that scales with length. There's uh, deceleration of extension rates. And this deceleration seems to be scale invariant. So those are the three, three plots that are, are data that uh, support these ideas. Uh, and so, what, so we've been thinking a lot about this. And uh, here's an idea that we came up very recently over the summer. And it goes back to actually thinking about what are these cables structurally? Something I really don't like to think about. I'm, you know, I'm a theoretical physicist. And I'd like to think about a cable as just this linear thing. And it has monomers coming on, monomers coming off well. It's not that simple, but it's the part. But it might. But the fact that it's not that simple might be a key to to understanding what's going on. So the, the way it's more complicated is that actually, when you look at these cables in EM, and this is not a cable in our yeast cell, it's a cable in fish and yeast. So it might be different in our yeast cells. But this is the only EM we have thus far. If you look at an EM image of a cable, it cons consists of a bunch of smaller filaments about 500 nanometers in length that are cross-linked, and there's a number of other filamentous structures in, in cells like, uh, for example, phylopodia or the actin comet tails uh, that go behind uh, listeria, something that Ashok worked on, I remember many moons ago with, with Julie Therio. Um, so there are other structures that have this, this base, the other uh, sort of functional structures that have this basic structure of a composite filament, composite meaning consists of many, many smaller filaments uh, that are cross-linked. And so we, and we know that this is the case also for 
actin filaments. So the idea we have is that feedback might just simply come from geometry. And what we mean by that is we know that these cables are assembled at the bud neck through these proteins called formins. They spit out filaments. And our idea is that if these filaments are spat out at some rate K plus, which is really determined by formins and profilin and so forth, but there's gonna be some ra constant rate at which these small filaments, of which are about 500 nanometers in length, if we take the EM I just showed you at face value. So they're spit out at some rate. But then there are depolymerizing proteins, and we know a number of them uh, in yeast, that remove these little filaments at rate K minus. But what that's going to do is, is if the, as the cable gets longer and longer, there's more and more of these little filaments that can be removed. So the rate at which mass leaves the cable increases with the length of the cable, and that gives you a feedback. So that's the, that's the very simple idea. Um, and what's nice about it is that the model itself only has three parameters, two of which we sort of know. One is the speed at which the filaments are fed into the system. That's like a, basically you can think of it as a treadmill in speed. We measure that because that's just the initial slope, which is about 0.25 micrometers per second. And then if we take, we take, um, we take the length of these filaments to be what's observed in fish and yeast, we can ask, oh, if we play around with this rate of filament removal, which we don't know, even though we have some in vitro experiments that suggest that it's tens of uh, monomers per second, can we account for all the other data that we see? And the answer is yes. So, um, so here's uh, just last week, we tried this out. So what we're doing here is taking this model that I just described for you. Filaments are fed in at rate K plus. Each filament has length of uh, they're fed in at rate 0.25 microns per second. Each filament has a length of 0.5 microns, and they're removed at some rate k minus. And so now you can change the value of k minus and ask what happens at steady state to the distribution of filaments. First of all, it's very interesting. You get a peak distribution. Turns out you, you can also compute it analytically. It's almost, but not quite, the Gumbel distribution. So for those of you who like math, there's some fun extremal value statistics here, but that's all just if you're interested in that kind of stuff, you can just put it on a, on, in Python and simulate it in two seconds because it's a very trivial simulation to write. Anyway, you get these peak distributions. Of course, depending on which value of K minus you choose, you get either things. If you have very large K minus, the distribution is peaked at small cable lengths. If you, get, if you do larger K minus, it's peaked at higher cable lengths. Interestingly enough, this also uh, makes the average cable length decelerate over time. And, uh, and it makes a prediction that's an experiment that we had not done. It predicts that the thickness of the filaments as measured by the number of actin monomers in the cross section should decay exponentially with cable length. And we actually did the experiments and saw that. And what's just to summarize what we see here is that I think we're about, if, we, if K minus is about 25 monomers per second, then we essentially, uh, for that one value of K minus, we reproduce all three graphs pretty well. Uh, so, so the model seems to capture these three. These are three very different experiments uh, done using different techniques at different times. Uh, and uh, the model seems to capture all this behavior. So we're kind of thinking this is what's going on. So, um, um, uh, so anyway, just to conclude, I guess at this point, um, we've, we now think we, um, we first of all, we think we have really good evidence that these actin cables, when they're being assembled, are actually being controlled by a, some feedback system. Uh, we think that the feedback system is actually, uh, its origins are simply the geometry, if you like, of, the, of, the, of, this, of these cables, namely that there are these cross, that, that there is uh, filamentous structures that are made by cross-linking a bunch of small filaments. Um, now we're, you know, actually, when I say now, yesterday as I was my, preparing my talk, I was thinking like, well, you know, can I, is there something you can actually say about how robust the feedback is if indeed its, uh, its origins are just kind of structure and not uh, sort of specific uh, molecular rates? Um, so does that mean that we can, you know, do variety of perturbations and still see? I don't know. So I'm just, I'm just thinking out loud. I don't know. This isn't fruitful avenue to follow, but, but I'm kind of excited to think about robustness. And, uh, and certainly we and others have found other control networks in, in, 
in, uh, in cells, uh, which sort of exhibit kind of some form of robustness. And, and that's, and that there, it's just, I'm just kind of curious if there's a general theme to it. Probably, you know, almost certainly there's not gonna be just one solution for everything, but, but I can't help myself as a theorist to kind of uh, having my head go in that direction. So, so those are some of the things I'm, I'm currently thinking about. And, um, and just to kind of you know, make sure I mention, there's a lot, a lot of people who, who have contributed over the years uh, to this work, both in my group and other, uh, other uh, friends of mine who run their own groups. Uh, most importantly, I have to mention Shane. Shane uh, and I started working when we, together when he was a grad student. He reached out to me on one of our MBL sojourns, uh, and we worked together on uh, Giardia, which is a, a really wonderful story that developed there, also having to do with length control. And then he, he's now a postdoc with Bruce Good and me, uh, work, and he's done all the experiments uh, that I've described for for yeast, these are experiments that Bruce and I have been imagining happening for over a decade, and Shane managed to figure out how to do all of them. So he's quite a wizard in the lab and also an incredibly good theorist at this point as well. And he does his own theory uh, on top of it. So I've become completely uh, superficial, which is, of course, the dream of every advisor. He's on the job market. So if anyone out there is, has openings for cell biologists who can do math and, and I think study really fantastically interesting problems, he's got many other things on his mind. Uh, you should look at his uh, application. Uh, Bruce, I should mention, is a longtime collaborator and uh, the actin cytoskeletal guru at Brandeis, who I've learned from tremendously. And then um, I also would like to mention Lishi, former grad student. She's now runs her own group at Rochester, who's been instrumental in developing ideas. And so have Ariel Amir, who's an uh, applied mathematician at Harvard, and Thomas, who's an applied mathematician colleague of mine here at Brandeis. And of course, my my wonderful theory students, uh, uh, some of whom, like Aldrich, are brave enough to actually do, do their own experiments. And Aldrich is doing some really wonderful experiments, which kind of follow up on some of these ideas where he's uh, something I'm very excited about, uh, detect finding, uh, as we suspected from theory, concentration gradients across, uh, the, across yeast cells. So now we're kind of coming up with this crazy idea that maybe there's uh, the kind of positional information that people have discovered in embryos, uh, uh, or uh, most, you know, most notably in Drosophila through Bitcoin and other morphogens, that we think now there's uh, protein gradients in yeast that actually dictate uh, self-assembly uh, in yeast uh, that is proportionally scaled to the size of the yeast cell. So that, that's a kind of a crazy wild idea. We'll see if it actually uh, goes anywhere, but but. What's tantalizing is that there is some uh, very um, preliminary experimental evidence suggesting that these, at least that these gradients exist. Now, whether they do what we think they do, that's, that's still a long road ahead. Thank you very much. Thanks for staying around. Um, uh, thanks to the people who fund me. And I'm really happy, I'd be happy to take questions and hang out uh, as long as people want to hang Thank out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yanni. So, uh, since uh, you know, I'm clapping on behalf of everyone. Uh, I thought we'll take one question uh, for the second part of the talk, and then we'll open it up for the general discussion. And so I'm just going to take, uh, and folks, please put your questions in the chat and please stay around. I'm just going to take Wallace's question uh, to begin with. So Wallace asked, uh, uh, Wallace, if you want, you can also unmute yourself and ask it yourself. Well, yeah, this is maybe this is just a naive thing. No! Hey, man, I was just imagining that maybe in terms of the dissociation constant, you wouldn't see any change until the filament hits the other side of the cell. I mean, later on, you showed that's definitely not the case, but like, uh, I was imagining just like a mechanical collision way of determining how long the cell is. Yeah, for a long time, we thought that must be going on. And actually one of the key results of Shane's experiments, it went all too fast, I'm sorry, is that I think the evidence is really good that the slowdown happens way before you reach the end. So something, okay. so there's, so, you know, so, so, dude, you were right. It's all about. It's all about. Uh, <laughs> it's all about. Uh, you know, um, making a feedback system, or what? What the, what, the way you usually uh, express it is? What do you call it? Uh, balance point. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm just going to pause for a second and stop recording, and I'm just going to.